his incredible influence felt through his beloved extended family, the Georgia people, and his players and associates for parts of seven decades. What an amazing influence. And we have an incredibly distinguished panel of speakers to pay tribute tonight, including some of the greatest football players in Georgia football history. I wanted to take just a moment to read a quote from one of the standout players from our 1980 national championship team, Chris Welton. Uh, Chris said, Coach Dooley was a great football coach, of course, but he was so much more than that. Coach Dooley was a role model, a mentor, and later in life, a friend. One of Coach Dooley's most admirable traits was his love for learning and passion for a wide variety of subjects. When he became curious about a subject, he attacked it until he was an expert. Most of my best friends to this day are people who are teammates or share a connection with Coach Dooley. What a gift. And indeed, as I thought about that, Coach Dooley has to be the only football coach ever to have both an iconic football field named for him, as well as a camellia and a hydrangea plant. When Coach Dooley came to Georgia prior to the 1964 football season at the age of 31, times were not good. We were losing, there wasn't much money, and Georgia was in, save for the 1959 SEC title, a decade and a half of depression and despair, as the famed Scottish author Thomas Carlyle would say, we were in the everlasting no. But things would change, and fast along with a fellow group of greats who had all gone to incredible Georgia legacies. Dan McGill, Irk Russell, Joe Leaves, Bill Hartman, and Larry Munson. They would usher in an era of sustained success and popularity for Georgia football and the University of Georgia that forms a foundation for where we are today. Six SEC titles, a regular in the national rankings, 19-6 and six against the enemy, 17-7-1 and one against Florida, the 1980 National Championship, and for me, when I was 8, 9, 10, and 11, that 43, 4, and 1 from 80 through 83, man, did I get spoiled. I thought it was going to be like that all the time. Uh, when Coach Dooley was hired, and I think uh, Kirby and I talked about this a few years ago when he was paying tribute in the naming of Dooley Field, and he said, what do you think is the ultimate testament to the legacy? And we talked about it. At Sanford Stadium, when he took the job, held 36,000 people. Well, now there'll be over 90,000 of our closest friends gathered tomorrow when we take on Tech. What an amazing legacy. As my friend Daryl Huckabee said, Georgia football before Vince Dooley was like rock and roll before Elvis. For nine years, Coach Dooley was both Georgia's head football coach and athletics director. And when he retired from coaching after 25 seasons on the sideline, he would serve as Georgia's athletic director, overseeing a tremendous era of championship-filled success that continues today. Coach Dooley knew talent. He surrounded himself with great people, including a lot of fantastic players. As a football coach, his first two coordinators were Irk Russell and Bill Dooley. He and Coach McGill hired Larry Munson. He brought back former great players like Mike Cavan, Steve Greer, John Casey, Charlie Whittemore, Pat Hodgson, and Joe Tereshinsky as assistant coaches. When he became AD, his first three hires were Jack Bowerly, Claude Felton, and Andy Landers. He married Barbara Meshad, the man knew talent. Coach Dooley always had an open door. And I think about this when I was working for Claude Felton and Coach McGill, a young 20-something from Statesboro, Georgia, just a lifelong Bulldog fan. And I really thought I knew everything back then. And I was working on a story for the old Bulldog magazine about the progression of college football. And I thought Coach Dooley's insight, of course, would be wonderful. What a resource. And I, in a not so eloquent way, talked about what a terrible job the NCAA Football Rules Committee was doing and how it was geared too much towards offense now. And after a diatribe that I wish was this eloquent, he took off his glasses as he was wanting to do it and said, well, you know, Jeff, I am the chairman of the NCAA Football Rules Committee. <laughs> Strike one. 
uh, as a bachelor for many years here in Athens, it was up for debate if I'd ever get married. When I informed the Dooleys that uh, Emily had agreed to walk the aisle, he used a line on me that he had a couple of my other friends through the years who had waited later in life to experience the magic of matrimony. Barbara couldn't believe it. We were at their house for a fundraiser for Governor Kemp, and she just shouted, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. Coach Dooley said, uh, Jeff, how old are you? I said, well, Coach, I just turned 43. He said, well, you wouldn't want to rush you to anything. <laughs> and make no mistake, you have definitely outpunted your coverage. <laughs> A few years ago, we were at the Sugar Bowl, and uh, Emily and I were honored to be amongst the VIPs on the team trip. And I love listening to the Dooley's banter. We were at a big table for breakfast, and some coach somewhere had signed some multi-million dollar contract and Miss Dooley simply said, Vince, you got out of coaching way too soon. We would be rich if you'd have kept coaching. And she looked at us. Now, by this time, I'd gained a little bit more tact. I didn't say a word and I was elbowing Emily. Don't you say anything. She said he didn't because he was going to have to maybe fire some people on his staff. And Coach Dooley said, well, what if I'd have fired you? She quickly retorted, you couldn't afford the buyout. <laughs> the last time I saw Coach Julia, I had to get a helmet signed for the Lighthouse Foundation. Uh, the great Kevin Butler, my broadcast partner, uh, is on the board there. This benefits uninsured and poor children who have vision problems, altruistic until the end, as uh, Danny was talking about with the letterman. He was signing the helmet. He was looking forward to a visit from his first great grandson, as Michael and Maggie had welcomed little Jack Vincent, who's sitting there in the front row next to Matthew over there. And Daniel and Deanna had said, yeah, just go on over to the house. And when we got there, uh, Coach Dooley was instructing his son-in-law, Destry Rogers, a general in the Air Force, mind you, who was on top of a ladder with clippers and a big sheath, how to properly prune a tree. And Destry was following orders like any good general learns how to do. His voice wasn't very strong, and uh, we talked about football for about 10 minutes, and I'll never forget that. <clears throat> and I know how special it was for him and our next speaker uh, to share in what happened on January the 10th at Indianapolis, just the greatest thing ever. Dreams do come true. And the image of those two embracing on the confetti-littered field of Lucas Oil Stadium will live on forever. And I know how proud he is of our head coach and his wife, Mary Beth, with the young family building this incredible championship program. And I know it brings back so many memories for the Dooley family from back in the 1960s. Now, if you would please join me in welcoming to the stage, I love saying this, the head coach of the top-ranked, undefeated, reigning national champion, University of Georgia Bulldogs. Hey, nobody does it like Dancer, I can promise you that, man. He's the best in the business. Appreciate those kind words. Uh, uh, Jeff, and thank you for giving me this opportunity, Miss Barbara and the Dooley family. Certainly, special night, and uh, means a lot for me to be here and even be asked and honored to speak and talk about uh, what Coach Dooley did for this community, myself, and this university. Which this university has paved the way for my life and my wife, who played basketball on this very floor, our lives. And both of us went through student athletes here at the University of Georgia and got to see Vince Dooley at every event he could possibly be at. Every time I went to any sporting event, he was there. He was there to shake our hand when we came off the field as a player. And I grew up in South Georgia, the son of a high school coach, watching his show every Sunday morning that I could turn the TV on and watch that show and hear that iconic voice. And for so many years, I just thought of this place. How could I get to this place? How could I ever get there? And never even fathomed being the head coach at the University of Georgia or being like Coach Vince Dooley. But the man that he was and what he meant to so many 
and has meant to so many is just incredible. I want to share a couple stories and um, one I think a lot of people have heard of and remember, but it sticks with me because I always think like, what about my relationship with Coach Dooley from the time, you know, I got hired here. You know, we didn't have a very good year the first year that I got hired here. And uh, he was great to be around. And, you know, I think back it was 1964 maybe when he had his first season. And, you know, we had a really good year, our second year. And I'll never forget in the indoor 2017, we've gotten back from Pasadena and we're, we've got to play a game in less than, by the time we got off the plane, it was less than six days. It was a quick turnaround. I wasn't going to sleep. I was committed. I told our coaching staff, and it kind of spread around the coaching world, which coaches don't want to come work for me now because of it. But I said, you can sleep when you die. I said, we're going to work this week, man, and we're going to get ready for this game. It's the biggest game they've had in Georgia in, at that time, it was almost 40 years, since 1980. And it's 2017. I said, so you can sleep when you die, but we're going to work this week. And I'll never forget, we're getting ready for practice in the indoor. And I looked up on the little ramp. There's a little on ramp where they call the Nally Lounge. And Coach Dooley was up there. And it was the first time that, as I was the head coach, I remember him being at practice and watching practice. And it was early in practice. We were doing some drills. I was not as involved. So I was like, I'm going up there. I'm going up there. I'm going to talk to him. You know, he's the only guy around here that's played in a game of this magnitude. I mean, certainly he could help me and lend me some advice and talk to me and at least bounce some ideas. So I went up there, and um, he was just observing practice. He was like, I'm just here watching and just wanted to see how things are going. And uh, I spent about five minutes with him, you know, and it, it, it was calming to my nerves to be able to see him and know he was there watching our practice, looking over it, and the things he had done. Now, of course, we went on to lose that game, okay? Fast forward, however many years, three, four, five years, and a lot of people have heard the story of this year's national championship game in Indianapolis. Um, the elevator, I'm going up the elevator, it was actually on this, it was, a, it was a night of the game. So I'm usually just exhausted from prep for the game, prep for the game, prep for the game, and I am at wit's end by what would be Friday night before the game. I hit 16 on the floor, go all the way up the 16th floor, the elevator opens, and sitting right in front of me on a stool, and nobody else around is Vince Dooley. And I'm like, are you kidding me? What, 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 what's he doing here? Coach! What are you doing? He's like, Daniel's don't have a key. He's got to go down and get another key. He's left, left me locked out. He's like, I, we were locked out of our room. And I could tell he was frustrated, perturbed, not happy. Um, but for just he and I sitting there. And I thought, Coach, why didn't you come to any of our practices like you did last time? He said, you know what happened last time? He said, I was like, glad you didn't come. Uh, but he said, you know, embrace the moment. He said, enjoy it. Uh, and then the next time I saw him was in the confetti after the game. And uh, that meant so much to me because I know the sacrifices that he made from being away from his family, the sacrifices that he made from missing kids' events, his children growing up, to put this place on the map. He put Georgia on the map. He paved the way. He paved the way in a foundation so strong that those of us that inherited it after him, it was not the same as when he took it over. And what an incredible job he did with this place as a leader, a visionary, and athletic director. His teams were physical. His teams could run the ball. His teams did not beat themselves. He was an excellent coach, but he was even a better leader of men. And those words he's always shared with me, those moments, even to the two, three weeks ago, we have a new dining hall, and I was leaving the dining hall, and he was in the dining hall just sitting there all by himself, just observing the players come in and out. And I was going by, and I was like, well, he's usually in the training room getting exercise or doing something with Ron. And I went back over and sat down, and uh, he was struggling to talk a little bit, and he's like, oh, my voice is it's hurting a little bit, but I just want to sit here and just kind of see the place and, and see you guys. And I sat down and had a long conversation with him, and uh, 
to, to every, credit, er, credit him every single time I ever got to visit with him, you felt like you were the only person on planet Earth and you were the most important person on planet Earth because he was there, he was present. And to do that for so long, for so many, and lay the foundation that he did for this university, I want to just say thanks to his family, the sacrifices he made, and celebrate a life of a man that uh, will be long, long, long remembered around here. So thank you and go dogs. Thank you very much, Kirby. Uh, just as there was tremendous pride in our great young football coach, the same goes for our great young athletic director with a great family, uh, Josh Brooks. Uh, the incredible job that he's doing, visionary, energetic, innovative, a winner. He's a driving force, a cornerstone, and a huge reason why we feel so great, obviously, about our present and the future, while always paying homage to our great history here at the University of Georgia. As we continue to strive to have the best football program in the country and strive to have the best all-around athletic program in America while doing it the right way, excelling academically, in the community, and in all aspects of life here in Athens. Coach Dooley took so much pride in the two men, the two leaders that sit in the chairs that he once occupied here at the University of Georgia, Kirby Smart, and ladies and gentlemen, our J. Reed Parker Director of Athletics, Josh Brooks. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here today, and I want to give a special thanks to my staff, especially Jessica Pope, Vince Thomas, Emily Dietz, for all the work they've done to, to really make these last few weeks so special for all of us, and especially the Dooley family. And I'd like to just express my love to the entire Dooley family, Miss Barbara. Since the day I got to Athens many, many years ago, you have opened up your home to me and your family to me, and I'm a transplant with no family here, so it's been... It's been special to have the entire Dooley family feel like an extension of my family, and I just love each and every one of you. Um, you know, I get to come to work every day and sit in an office once occupied by Vince Dooley, and I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't pinch myself and think, what the heck am I doing in this chair? And, and the, pr the pressure it puts, but at the same time, I've made a promise to Miss Barbara and to Daniel and the family that I will honor that legacy and do the best I can to represent everything he stood for. And Coach Smart said it, and you'll hear this term a lot, I think Coach Julie was truly a visionary, an innovator. Many of the traditions that we celebrate today and that, we're, that we focus on were because of his innovation and because of his vision. You think about bringing the G logo to Georgia and what that stands for now. I think about the legendary coaches he hired, some of which are still coaching for me today. I mean, it, uh, you know, it, it's unbelievable. I even think about the Butts Mirror Building. If you really think back to the mid-80s, that was one of a kind. To have a standalone athletic department building that wasn't part of a coliseum or a football stadium built uh, as a standalone facility and a facility that still serves us well 35 years later plus to this day. It, it truly is remarkable, the vision he had and, and how far he could see and, and where he took the University of Georgia. I often tell people, almost similar to what Coach Smart said, the success we have today is due to the foundation he built. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Everything we accomplish today is because of many of the lettermen in this room and Coach Dooley and the phenomenal coaches he hired. Think about this. Um, I want to talk, speak more on his time as an AD. He became AD in 1979. At that point, the University of Georgia had one national championship, obviously the 1942 football championship. One in all sports. Over the next 25 years, Georgia will go on to win 23 national championships across various sports, 85 SEC championships, all while doing it with integrity and class and establishing what we would come to know as the Georgia way and how we do things with class, always. Um, you know, he, he set a phenomenal example for me and people often ask me, what are some of the lessons he taught you? And you know, the many times we would talk, what he offered more than advice was support. Because in this job, you get a lot of advice a lot of the time. But knowing that, uh, as JD once said so well, the problems are similar, the same. The numbers may be different, but a lot of the problems are the same. Knowing that he went through all these challenges over the course of 25 years, AD, gives me great comfort. 
knowing the advice and the, the counsel he would give me about um, staying the course and, and sticking true to who you are. And, you know, you can read thousands of leadership books and, and what it means to be a leader, but there were two fundamental principles that I took from Coach Dooley that I try to emulate as best I can to this day. Two things, work hard and treat people with respect and kindness. Two things, work hard and treat people with respect and kindness. It really is as simple as that. And, um, and I am forever indebted to Coach and the family. He was a, a friend, a mentor, a confidant. And um, again, I will always step foot in that office every day with the goal of representing his legacy the best that I can. Coach Dooley is University of Georgia Athletics, and Georgia Athletics is Coach Dooley. God bless Coach Dooley, and God bless the Dooley family. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker, the 22nd president of the greatest university in the world, the University of Georgia, President Jerry Moorhead. Uh, prior to becoming president in 2013, President Moorhead served the university in many key administrative roles, including senior vice president for academic affairs and provost, vice president for instruction and director of the honors program. President Moorhead is the Meg's Professor of Legal Studies at the Terry College of Business, where he has had a faculty appointment since 1986, and he's a 1980 graduate of the UGA School of Law. I first met President Moorhead when he would go on some basketball trips back with us when he was our faculty athletic rep. And our university's prestige, research and development, postgraduate scholarship winners, and academic standing is just incredible. I think I speak for many of us. Thank God I got in when I did. A lifelong Bulldog supporter, the president of the world's greatest university, President Jerry Moorhead. Well, thank you, Jeff. It is such an honor for me to be here this evening. And I want to just begin by thanking all of you for being a part of this very special celebration of Coach Dooley's life. He had a transformative legacy on the University of Georgia. And our institution is not the same because of his leadership and his contributions. I had the opportunity to first get to spend a significant amount of time with Coach Dooley when I was serving on our athletic board and as our faculty athletics representative over 20 years ago. And during that time, he always gave me sound advice and wise counsel was always warm and hospitable. And one of the things that I remember to this day is the conversations that we would have where he would say, what book are you reading? And is it worth me reading? And then he would tell me the books that he was reading. You don't have many of those kinds of conversations like that, uh, no offense, with athletic directors, uh, <laughs> and head football coaches uh, today. But Coach Dooley was a real scholar, and I witnessed in an athletic director someone who had tremendous leadership skills and was always focused on just one thing, making Georgia athletics better and stronger. As Josh said a moment ago, he had a vision for Georgia athletics, and he was constantly about advancing that vision every day with everything that he did. My fondest memory of Coach Dooley, though, is from my time as president of this great university. When Greg McGarrity, our athletic director at the time, and I went to his home to tell him that we were planning to name Dooley Field in his honor. Now, the planning for this special moment had involved so many key individuals, beginning with Governor Kemp and concluding with the support of our athletic board and our board of regents. 
What I remember about that morning when I arrived with Greg was Barbara, of course, crying and kissing both of us uh, when we announced Dooley Field would be named, and she was extremely happy and proud uh, for her husband. But I also remember Coach Dooley just quietly and humbly receiving the news, thanking us, and then offering to show us around his garden, which was his pride and joy. And we spent the next hour or so uh, getting the opportunity to have that special tour with him. Even at those great moments like that one, in his storied career, he was always calm, always collected. I love that about him. And then being on the field with Barbara and him and the family, when the official naming occurred, is a moment that I will never forget as president of the University of Georgia. That day, the entire Bulldog Nation was very, very happy. Coach Dooley was not just an iconic coach and a beloved athletic director, but all of you know he was very generous with his support of many other areas of this institution, including the UGA libraries. He and Barbara established the Vincent J. Dooley Library Endowment Fund, and Coach Dooley served for many years as a member of the Board of Visitors for the library. He also worked as a trustee for the Georgia Historical Society, which benefited the entire state of Georgia. So in the years since he retired as athletic director, he continued to make a profound and important impact on the University of Georgia, visiting classes, coming to so many special events. If we had a dedication, Coach and Mrs. Dooley were at that dedication, and they were there to support not only the athletic side of this institution, but the academic enterprise as well. My late mother cherished, until her death, a photograph of Coach Dooley kissing her at my investiture as president in 2013. He touched so many other lives the same way. Coach Dooley's love of our institution was unwavering, and he worked until the very end tirelessly to support this great institution. He has left a legacy that will be remembered for generations to come, and he will be missed by all of us that had the opportunity to know him and to learn from him. He and Barbara were the perfect pair, and I know she and her children will now carry on the Dooley legacy as it continues at the University of Georgia. Thank you, Coach Dooley, for all you have meant to the University of Georgia. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, a lifelong Bulldog fan and native Athenian, husband to a beautiful first lady, one of the most famous cheerleaders in Georgia history, Marty Argo Kemp. Uh, he and Coach Dooley's son, Daniel, used to occupy the quick side of Billy Henderson's offensive line, protecting David Duke's blind side for the Gladiators back in the 1980s. He's a longtime friend of the Dooley family and an incredible supporter of the University of Georgia. Governor, congratulations on winning your second term just a couple of weeks ago. And I sure hope your next order of business is presenting the Governor's Cup to the Georgia Bulldogs tomorrow afternoon. The greatest governor in the world, the governor of the greatest state in America, Georgia, Governor Brian Kemp.
Thank you, J.D. I appreciate that kind introduction and good evening, everyone. I just want to, again, like so many people have said tonight, just thank you guys for being here. And uh, I would just say on behalf of Marty and the girls, we are just so honored to be able to take part in such a special tribute to a man that we were so blessed to know and love. And to Miss Dooley and the entire family, just please know that we continue to mourn your husband, your father, and your grandfather with you. Um, like most of us here, uh, certainly for our family, Saturdays in Athens for us will just be a little different now. I want to thank Coach Smart and Director Brooks and President Moorhead and just so many of the football heroes who are here with us today who had the privilege and honor of being coached by Vince Dooley and so many others, as has been said already, that he worked with, people that knew him. We are just honored to be in your presence. Coach Dooley was many things, and you've heard a lot of those already today, and you've read a lot of things since the day that he passed. But Marty and I had a little different perspective. We had the blessings of knowing and learning from the man beyond the legend. It was as a friend of his children that I got to see Vince Dooley, the father. It was as a student that I learned from his approach to life and work. And when I grew older, I appreciated just how valuable those many lessons were. I also got to see a woman of strength and character by his side, Miss Dooley. After that, I grew to appreciate that love that he shared with her for 62 years. Marty and I got to spend a little time with Miss Dooley and much of the family shortly after Coach passed, and she told us a story about a question that Coach Dooley sometimes would get asked. How did you and Mrs. Dooley make it so long? Coach would answer, it was easy. We never hated each other at the same time. Words of wisdom for us all. But that was a love that endured and a love that I believe will be united again in due time and it will be for eternity. But I also had the benefit of seeing Coach Dooley's business-like approach and some of the speakers have already talked about that today and it's quite honestly one of the things that I still don't think he gets enough credit for. But it was, it was uh, when I was just a small business person first starting out that I used the lessons learned from Coach's strong leadership style as a transformational athletics director. And Josh talked a lot about this. Much has been said of his incredible football record, and it certainly speaks for itself. But his impact went far beyond the hedges and literally transformed the entire athletics department and in many ways the whole university itself. Under his leadership, the university expanded its sports facilities and grew its women's athletic programs. Golf, tennis, and other recreational outlets that weren't always treated as priorities on other uh, campuses around the country were fixtures at this university not only improving UGA's athletics, but its overall student experience. That transformation was the result of Coach Dooley's business-like mind, his ability to envision something new, to plan and to build it from scratch, and to build it to last, much like the additions to Sanford Stadium that surround the very appropriately named Dooley Field. Even on a campus full of people who excel, Coach Dooley's quality of leadership was rare. And that's why generations from now, Georgia dogs from all across this state and beyond will know and revere the name Vince Dooley. It will be cherished just as much as we cherish his memory today because of how much that one man and the Dooley family touched our lives. 
and like other families who've had the pleasure to know him personally. Each time Marty, the girls, and I yell, go dogs, we will think of the man beyond the legend, Vince Dooley, a mentor, a friend, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a truly damn good dog. One of the most inspiring things that has happened to me and to Joe Lee's athletic director at Georgia is to sense as we've traveled around the state and we know from a competitive standpoint that Georgia's ship has gone through rough and battered seas and we feel like that now among Georgia people that they are rallying to go forward with something progressive for the university. Coach Vince Dooley, head football coach for 25 seasons from 1964 to 1988. A husband, a father, Georgia's winningest coach with 201 victories, six SEC championships and the 1980 national championship. Notre Dame and won the national championship. He coached 40 first team All-Americans, 10 academic All-Americans, and a Heisman winner. Great Looking for Hudson throws. A boy down the middle of the king to play to the 36. 10, 5, touchdown. In trouble. And there's a man over the arm. Touchdown. Touchdown. Ladies and gentlemen, the Georgia Bulldogs have won the Super Bowl in their first. 1982 National Coach of the Year, seven-time SEC Coach of the Year, and the state of Georgia and Alabama Hall of Fame. I'm proud of you, and to the city of Jacksonville, and this great sports city, I'm proud to end my career here in Jacksonville. Thanks again also my special love to the Georgia people for all your support for a quarter of a century. I'm going to do that. Thank you. A true damn good dog. Like so many uh, young boys growing up here in the state of Georgia, uh, the two cornerstones of my world will always be the Georgia Bulldogs and the Masters. For my money, Sanford Stadium and Augusta National are the two greatest places on earth. And one of our most distinguished football lettermen has literally lived the dream. All SEC for the 1968 SEC champions succeeded his father, who was a great player back in the 1940s, a successful entrepreneur who had an incredible dream and made it come true, spearheading the charge to bring the Olympic Games to Atlanta, Georgia, and Athens, right in this very building. And then, of course, the chairman of the Augusta National Golf Club, ladies and gentlemen, number 87, Billy Payne. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Jeff. I am so honored to be here tonight. Like so many of us, I sat at home yesterday celebrating Thanksgiving and giving thanks to the many ways God has blessed me with a wonderful family and wonderful friends. And you know what? Thanksgiving comes again today, as so many of my teammates, other Bulldog faithful, gather here tonight to give our thanks, our special thanks, to our once-in-a-lifetime hero, Vince Dooley. <clears throat>
No doubt we all have our personal stories of Coach Dooley. Mine began in the fall of 1964, when beginning his coaching career here at Georgia, he showed up one Friday night recruiting me at one of my high school football games. I knew he was going to be there, and I was very nervous. And after the game, he approached me and reached out and shook my right hand and with his other hand hugged me as he pulled me in towards him. A couple of weeks ago, 58 years after that first night, he hugged me again as I sat beside him on his couch the day before his Lord and Savior called him home. That morning, and very much aware of his declining health, I was fully expecting to have to do all the talking. But no, not with Coach Dooley, notwithstanding his current health. He started the conversation by asking me if I remembered that critical pass I dropped against Auburn in 1966. <laughs> that was my Coach Dooley to the very end, aware of everything around him, to the very end, surrounded, loved, and embraced by his wonderful wife, Barbara, and their four amazing children. We will hear often tonight about Coach Dooley's incredible Hall of Fame coaching career here at Georgia, but his life's work was about so much more. He was a teacher, not just of football skills, but of life skills. He taught us the importance of integrity by demonstrating it every single day of his life. He worshiped and was obsessive about the mandate of preparation. And above all, he demanded effort but promised us at the same time that that same effort would be the guarantor of our success. He was a mentor and a friend of so many of us who were honored to play for him, so many of us here tonight to celebrate and to rejoice in his life. And as we all know, Coach Dooley was a very serious man, not wasting words or ever leaving in doubt what he was thinking. And I remember I was once the very direct recipient of this famous straightforward approach. Just before spring practice, preceding my senior year, I received a message to report to Coach Dooley's office the next afternoon. That was unusual. Uh-oh, I thought, what have I done wrong? I spent the entire day trying to convince myself that it couldn't possibly be that bad. No way that I was in that much trouble. I mean, as my teammates at that time will tell you, I was really dull and boring. So I decided to enter his office, displaying the confidence and the cockiness of my displaying my first two years of playing for him at offensive end, leading the team in receiving and making some all-star teams. I mean, nothing could really be that bad. Well, I walked into Coach Dooley's office and he didn't invite me to sit down. <clears throat> uh oh, I thought, it must really be bad. Without any preamble whatsoever, he looked up and said, and I will never forget his exact words, Billy, we have somebody better than you to play offense next year. I'm moving you to defense. 
Defense. Defense. I was stunned, immediately humiliated. My ego instantly crushed. Defense. Coach Dooley then started smiling a bit, and he said, don't take it so hard, Billy. I'm actually doing you a favor. It will be an easy job, he said, because immediately to your right will be Bill Stanfield, and immediately behind you will be Jake Scott, as you all know, two of the greatest players in the history of Georgia football. I thought about it a little while. Bill Stanfield, Jake Scott, and I look back at Coach Dooley and smile. Coach, I've always wanted to play defense. <laughs> And through time, playing for him and afterwards, Coach Dooley became my second father, a man who would counsel me throughout my entire complex career in life, a man who would tell me without hesitation when I was wrong, but loved me even when I made mistakes, and to think, I am just one of the many hundreds and thousands of other young men and women he blessed by his example of life and of love. And so we say goodbye now to this remarkable man. Yes, in many ways with a heavy heart, but also with the hope that God will bless us all in death as he did in life by placing us once again at Coach Dooley's side. Thank you, Coach Dooley. We love you. Our next speaker, one of the greatest tailbacks to ever play between the hedges, and I think for a lot of us uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s, if there was one position that you thought about that personified Georgia football, it was a tailback position. He's synonymous with the 1978 Wonder Dogs, who had the 9-1-1 one one regular season. Larry Munson bringing his exploits to so many of us from the 24-17 victory down at LSU when Lindsey Scott ran back the second half kickoff and the 17-16 victory at Kentucky when Rex Robinson struck true. He's a part of one of the first families of Georgia football. His son, Brian, a current assistant and a fine wide receiver. His nephew, Warren, a stellar offensive tackle for the reigning national champions. And the patriarch of the great family, the 1978 SEC Player of the Year, number 36, Willie McClendon. So good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really my pleasure uh, to be here speaking to you all this evening uh, when it concerning Coach Dooley. I'm just, as Billy said, one of thousands of knuckleheads that Coach Dooley and his staff took a look at through game film and they thought, well, yeah, this guy can be a Georgia Bulldog, and we're going to recruit this guy. So once again, for all the other thousands and thousands of knuckleheads out there like me, Coach Dooley, Miss Dooley, we thank your husband. We thank your husband tremendously, okay? My association with Coach Dooley started in 1974. I had a chance to meet him one summer. He's down in Brunswick uh, visiting, and all of a sudden, my mom, my dad, and I, we're meeting Coach Dooley in, in a construction office. And I think he picked up very, very quickly that mom ran the family. And she was concerned about her kid not meeting that curfew of when 
the lights come on late in the evening. And he assured her that I would be under a 11 o'clock curfew and at that time I'm enjoying it. Yeah, that sure enough beats coming in when that street light comes on. <laughs> she also wanted to make sure that her son was in an academic support group, study hall, and most of all, those three meals. Mom was a good old country girl, loved cooking for her sons. I'm the oldest of six boys and one girl. And she absolutely loved cooking for her boys. And when she felt comfortable that I would be taken care of with curfew being in the, the dorm, I was gonna get those three square meals a day. She felt great. Attending the University of Georgia, I had three goals on my mind. Number one was to stay close and absolutely to the culture of the religious standards that mom and dad set in our house. Secondly, I was going to make sure that I not shame my family name and our community. And third, eventually it happened, was to graduate from college. Okay. So those are the standards that I set as I came at this university, got to meet thousands and thousands of friends for the rest of my life. A lot of them are here today honoring once again the one guy that made it necessary for all of us to be a part of this great university and enjoy being part of this dog's family. My freshman year in high school, in college, take that back, my freshman year in college, I wanted no parts of varsity football. There was a freshman football team. We were practicing over there with the freshmen. And you could look down. I was playing offensive running back, outside linebacker, and you could watch those varsity players out there just going at it. And man, I'm, oh no, I don't need any of this. <laughs> Not this time. I'm too, too, too young, too weak, and most of all, too scared. Sophomore year, being a part of that SEC championship team, Sugar Bowl, playing on New Year's Day down in New Orleans. Thrill of my life, absolutely. Still wondering though, have we, have we caught Tony Dorsett yet? <laughs> that was such a, such a tremendous time there. Junior year in college, 1977, Oh, I hate to bring this up, but yeah, part of Coach Dooley's only losing season. Coach Dooley made tremendous changing in his offense that offseason. We also heard that there was a number of Georgia alumnus that decided that they were going to buy some property and give it to Coach Dooley if he has another losing season and that property was in hell. <laughs> now I'm wondering, what in the world are we into here? <laughs> Senior year, Wonder Dogs. At, at this time, we're having a tremendous season. Nobody wondered how we we're gonna win this thing, how good we we're gonna be coming off of that disastrous 1977 college season. And we went to work that January, strength and conditioning, changing the offense, going from a veer type offense to the I formation offense. And I love those three plays. Willie right, Willie left, and Willie up the middle. Absolutely loved it. Right. 
So I stand here today once again, Miss Barbara, the Dooley family. We love you all tremendously. Your husband, your father has been a tremendous asset for this state. And I'm going to close this out with a prayer that I said 41 years ago after we played Georgia Tech. Dear Lord, we're the University of Georgia Bulldogs. And to hell with Georgia Tech. Go dogs. Can I get an amen? All right. <laughs> Our next speaker, another one of my favorites, the captain of the 1980 national champions, one of the greatest linebackers to ever play for Georgia. And I have always loved, too, the lineage. He was number 48, and he passed that down to his heir apparent the following year, number 48, Knox Culpepper. That was greatness following greatness, much like Rex Robinson to Kevin Butler, number five to number five. An incredible player and a cornerstone of Georgia's incredible defense in 1980. He had one of his greatest games when all the chips were down against Notre Dame in that unforgettable 17-10 victory over the Fighting Irish to deliver the national championship. He had 11 tackles and caused the fumble recovered by Chris Welton with Georgia leading 10-3 that led to Herschel Walker, the goal line stalker's second touchdown and eventually that great 17-10 victory. He's gone on to a highly successful career with Coca-Cola. Ladies and gentlemen, El Capitan, number 48, Frank Ross. Thank you very much, appreciate it. It's an honor to represent Coach Dooley's teams of the 80s today and honor a great man. The previous speakers are making this a tough act to follow, so I'll do the best I can, especially my fellow Letterman, Billy Payne, and Willie McClendon. Coach Dooley will always be special to many people across Georgia, our great nation, and the world for different reasons. He was a great athlete, a legendary Hall of Fame football coach, ultra successful athletic director, a mentor, historian, master gardener, author, speaker, philanthropist, community leader, fundraiser, volunteer, missionary, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, son, brother, friend, and probably most important of all, a man of faith. He was truly a Renaissance man. But to his players, he was a coach and a mentor. I learned more from his actions than any pep talk or speech that he gave us. How many people can say they had a gener generational impact on thousands of young men entrusted in them? Oftentimes, it was with tough love. I know, because I was the recipient of that a few times, as I'm sure, as I look out here to some of my former teammates, you were part of that, uh, recipient, receiving that same treatment. The pig incident comes to mind just to mention one. It seemed like a great idea at the time, and it was a lot of fun doing it. Not so much when we stood in front of him as he scolded and disciplined us. When I think of Coach Dooley, three main traits come to mind. He was disciplined, and he expected us to be disciplined in carrying out our responsibilities and showing restraint when it was necessary. If you want to test his patience and make him crazy, a 15-yard penalty would do that. He was always prepared and made sure that we were prepared for any situation, which in turn transferred, translated into confidence in the process and performance on the field. And lastly, he believed in toughness and hard work, which, re which resonated with his constant message of never, never, never quit. That is probably one of the reasons his teams won more games in the fourth quarter than any other team he convinced us the fourth quarter belonged to UGA. Now, there's a difference between Vince Dooley, the coach, and Vince Dooley, the man, especially in terms of how you interacted with him. As a player, you had a healthy fear of him because of his, the, the player-coach dynamic and his no-nonsense approach to coaching. Players would describe him as stoic, serious, hard-ass, and some even were scared of him, although I believe it's more a health of respect. However, he also had a softer and caring side 
with endearing qualities. As a player, you could approach him in private and discuss things that were weighing heavily on you, and he would become more of a mentor and a father. Additionally, to his former athletes, he has always been, able, he's always been easily approachable and willing to help. Not, not many people outside the program know that when, we used up, when a player used up his uh, eligibility, he made sure that your education was covered as long as you were making the effort to get that degree. I don't know of any other football coach in the country at that time that was doing that for their players. And contrary to what most of us thought, he did sometimes have a sense of humor. I remember one such instance in his 1980 before the Vanderbilt game. He was involved in a, a little wreck in downtown Athens, and obviously we heard about it through the radio. And the next day he came to the, to the meeting, team meeting we had, and he walked in and he'd gotten hit pretty good in that crash and his face was swollen, his lips were really sticking out. And like most 18 to 22 year old young men, we were holding back from just dying laughing. <laughs> and you could see it. And he stopped as he was talking about the game plan and he finally just turned around and said, well, damn it, go ahead and laugh. <laughs> and we did. In all seriousness, aside from all his achievements, such as the number of victories, bowl games and championships, his lasting legacy will be the lives he impacted and the achievements of the young men he coached. His players were known to chief success as professional athletes, business leaders, physicians, educators, administrators, lawyers, salesmen, coaches, firemen, and soldiers among many careers. What we all share is a common or what we all share are the common lessons we learn and sharpen while playing for him. Discipline, determination, toughness, character, no quit mindset, and a thirst for lifelong learning. His leadership and body of work has probably meant more to the University of Georgia than any other individual that has served UGA. He built a national powerhouse football team. He established one of the top athletic programs in the country and created a national brand that flourishes today academically, athletically, and financially. Coach Dooley was committed to making this a better world, and he did this through his community service, charity work, serving on boards of many prominent nonprofits, and financially supporting initiatives and programs with Barbara joined him in all these. He was so committed that we worried of his well-being sometimes. I remember during one of our mission trips to Honduras, where we were helping build schools, playgrounds, and pavilions in 90-degree heat, Semen had to be mixed by hand, or by shovels, obviously, since there weren't any mixing machines, and then pushed on wheelbarrows one at a time to the location where you dumped it. Coach was in his mid-80s and was mixing cement and carrying and pushing wheelbarrows with the best of us when someone suggested to Coach that he slow down because he didn't want anything to happen to him five hours away from any medical facilities. Coach stopped shoveling, gave the gentleman that look that only he could give, and y'all know what I'm talking about and said, well, if that is the case, I will have died serving. That was the end of that conversation. However, his two greatest achievements, and make no mistake about it, they were. First was Mary Barbara, 62 years ago. Now, you want to talk about a live wire. Coach got more than he bargained when he, when he chased her down. But as they say, behind every successful man, there's even a greater woman, and that's no more true than it is with Barbara. Secondly, raising full respectful, successful, and family-loving children in Deanna, Daniel, Denise, and Derek. And it's befitting that millions of fans will be reminded of Coach Dooley every time the dogs play between the hedges on Dooley Field. In closing, I firmly believe that at the end, when it's all said and done, we're all are measured by how much more we gave than we took. There's no question Coach Dooley took a lot more than he gave. I mean, he gave a lot more than he took. And we in the world were a lot better off for it. He was definitely a servant leader, and that's probably the best description I could give of him. In closing, I'll leave you the words from Scripture found in Matthew 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. Rest in peace, Coach Dooley. Well, 
First of all, it's, it's a huge loss not only for Georgia athletics, but for college athletics. He uh, was truly a, a standard bearer, if you will, for things like teamwork, discipline, work ethic, integrity, and uh, always just trying to do the right thing. When I think of Coach Dooley, I think of preparation, focus, discipline, and determination. Those are the things that I remember being coached by him and the preparation part, meaning every and any facet of the game that could occur, you will have been exposed or had an opportunity to experience it before that actually ever happened. Uh, leave no stones unturned, and that stuck with me, and I took it away from here to the National Football League as a player. Coach Dooley taught me how to be responsible. Responsibility, accountability, make sure you're there. Be there on time and be there on time. Be five minutes early, don't be five minutes late. When you think about Georgia athletics, you think Coach Dooley, right? And he had a presence about him. The presence was the standard. You knew when Coach Dooley was around, we're gonna shape up a little bit. Um, you know, make sure that we're doing things the right way. He was a man of integrity, always wanting to do things the right way. So I think people just knew that. He was a great influence to a lot of people and, and a tremendous organizer, tremendous uh, leader, and CEO, tremendous uh, ambassador for this university. He, he was one of the best I've ever, I've ever seen at that. I think the, the key to the whole thing was Vince Dooley, Coach Dooley, to know that you made such a difference at the time you wasn't thinking about the difference that you made and now you see what an impact that you had on so many people, not just the black athlete, but the white ones also. With him being in charge and running the show, it turned out to be something special, man. It really turned out to be something special. Coach Dooley built, uh, you know, basically the foundation and much of what Georgia Athletics is today. I think when you say Georgia Athletics, it goes along right with Coach Dooley. They're, you know, one and the same. What he did for the football program and athletics in whole was unbelievable, but it was the entire university. He, he contributed to everything to the university. Tremendous scholar along with being a tremendous coach. Our next speaker heads up the greatest conference ever in an era of record prosperity and popularity. The success of the Southeastern Conference continues to astound. Uh, here are just a few quick notes from a season ago. SEC teams won the national championship in baseball, women's basketball, track and field, and in football. <laughs> Georgia. <laughs> Over the last five years, four different SEC teams have won the national championship in baseball. Over the last three years, three different SEC skills have won the national championship in football, including last year, Georgia. The premier leader of any conference, the head of the toughest league in the land, SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey. It's always a bit dangerous when you leave your prepared remarks, but that Sugar Bowl celebration back in 1981, given what I've dealt with in stadiums the last month or so, how in the world did you get that many people on the field to rush after the game? On December 8th and 9th in 1932, 13 universities and colleges sent representatives to a meeting of the Southern Conference held in Knoxville, Tennessee. And at the end of that meeting, those 13 representatives agreed to form what we now know as the Southeastern Conference. 95 days before that meeting took place in Knoxville, Vincent Joseph Dooley was born in Mobile, Alabama. And the Southeastern Conference is the better for his life. It's my privilege to represent the 14 universities of the SEC, of today's 
SEC to offer my condolences, but to also say thank you. Thank you for a life well lived in contributing to the University of Georgia, the state of Georgia, and our entire region and nation. I first became a member of the SEC staff in November 2002. My first day, I called a former member of the office and asked, do you have any advice? And the one thing I remember being told was that former staff member said, whatever you do, don't genuflect to anyone. So I had to go to the dictionary to figure out what in the world that meant. The essence was, call everyone by their first name. Six weeks later, after starting on my first day in the SEC office, I was at a meeting of the SEC's athletics directors, and you're going to recognize some of the names in that room. Doug Dickey was at Tennessee, Jeremy Foley at Florida, David Housel at Auburn, Mal Moore at Alabama, and Skip Burtman at LSU. And there were others. One of those athletics directors still works today, Mitch Barnhart at the University of Kentucky in this league. There were two names in particular. When it was time to say hello one-on-one, -on -one, my, my voice became shaky. One was Frank Broyles, because I'd seen him on ABC TV. I didn't know him as the athletic director. I knew him as this personality. The other was Vince Dooley. That day, with a lack of confidence fully present in my voice, I said, hi, Vince, I'm Greg. Today, though, he's coach, because it's my intent to convey the respect that he deserves by referring tonight to Coach Dooley. My first real encounter, if you will, with Coach Dooley was that January 1st night in 1981. I grew up outside a city called Auburn. Now, easy, it's in New York, which is probably worse. <laughs> and I was watching the Sugar Bowl on TV, and being a Baptist in a predominantly Catholic area, my favorite team was whoever was playing Notre Dame that night. I watched Coach Dooley carried, as we've seen this evening, off the field by his players after winning that national championship. Somehow, appropriately, my final encounter with Coach Dooley was on January 10th of this year in Indianapolis, Indiana. I have been on the field or on a track or on a court for any number of national championship celebrations, but that night, in Indianapolis, I experienced the most energetic and enthusiastic championship celebration I've ever witnessed. In fact, he's he, he's gone, but Kirby was chest bumping everyone he could find. And when he came to me, I said, Kirby, I'm 500 on the evening. I won one and I lost one as the commissioner of the conference. And one of us is going to be injured if you try to just chest bump me. In fact, Josh walked up shortly thereafter, limping from his chest bumping activity, <laughs> having pulled a hamstring. And President Moore had, had as big a smile on his face as I'd ever seen in our almost 20 year relationship. And then I saw Coach Dooley standing actually next to Billy Payne, quiet, with a smile and a tear in his eye because of the pride of what he had witnessed that evening. I'm often asked, what's the best part of the job of being commissioner? You get to go to games, you're on TV, you know Paul Feinbaum. <laughs> the best part of my job is that the people who are seen on television, like I did that night in 1981, or they see from afar while they sit in the stands at a football game, I get to know as people. The best part of the job is being on a football field in Indianapolis, sharing that moment with Coach Dooley. The best part of the job is to sit in the Dooley's living room with Coach Dooley and my predecessor, Commissioner Mike Slive, as Coach Dooley talks about and then takes us through his garden. The best part of the job is to sit next to Coach Dooley and to Barbara a few years ago to Falcons game and to tell him about the crazy idea I had to hold an athletics directors meeting in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania 
and the experience of a staff member from the Army War College telling us the history of the Battle of Gettysburg and translating that history into leadership lessons. I thought I'd paid attention on that three-day trip in Gettysburg, and then I listened to Coach Dooley for the rest of the game talk to me about history. I didn't know anything, and I don't remember that game other than that conversation. The best part of the job is in May 2015 in Amelia Island, Florida, at a dinner where we had invited all the athletics directors who had been a part of the Southeastern Conference while Mike Slive was its commissioner. Wisdom all around the room, but to be at a table with Coach Dooley, with Barbara, with my wife Kathy, and with Roy Kramer, the sixth commissioner of the Southeastern Conference. And Coach Dooley began to tell a story about a game Vanderbilt played at, excuse me, Georgia played at Vanderbilt. And he said he noticed as they were playing, there was an ESPN banner hanging in Vanderbilt Stadium. And so the next day, he had a member of Georgia's staff call Roy Kramer, who at that time was the athletics director at Vanderbilt. And the staff member said, Mr. Kramer, Coach Dooley's asked me to call. He noticed an ESPN banner, and he just wondered, was that game televised last weekend? And Roy responded that, yes, in fact, it was. And the staff member said, thank you. I'll let Coach know. A few moments later, the phone rang again in Nashville. It was that same Georgia staff member saying, well, I shared it with Coach Dooley, and he wondered, um, was Vanderbilt paid for that game being on television? And Roy Kramer said, well, in fact, it was on television, and we were paid. He said, thank you. I'll let Coach Dooley know. And a few minutes later, the phone rang yet again. And that businessman that's been referred to took over. And that same staff member said, Coach Dooley wondered, how much, how much were you paid for that game? It was $7,500. The best part of the job was to sit at that table and watch those two guys debate about the $3,750 that Roy Kramer owed Vince Dooley for being on television <laughs> that night. As a quarterback, an assistant coach, a head football coach, an athletic director, Coach Dooley, worked with seven of the SEC's eight commissioners. He only missed one. It was Martin S. Connor. And he only missed Martin Connor because Coach Dooley was in grade school at the time. Martin Connor was the SEC commissioner. There are plenty of stories about Coach Dooley, better told by people other than me. But the life of Coach Dooley in many ways is the story of the Southeastern Conference lived through a mutual journey. It is the commitment to high-level competition in an academic setting, dealing with the highs of victory and the lows of defeat, building and keeping relationships with competitors who somehow become friends even though they won't pay you the $3,750 they owe you. It's achieving at the highest levels. Yep, that's winning seasons, it's winning bowl games, and winning national championships. But it's also, it's also the people. During the COVID season of 2020, I travel around with a little leather wallet called a pocket briefcase, and there's a few sayings in there. I typed a bunch of notes from my own reading, but I also included a note that I heard from Ronnie Swopes when I spoke at the Touchdown Club here in Athens. I'd agreed to something Lauren Smith never really fully explained, which was me driving him around touchdown and quarterback clubs in the state of Georgia for two days that year. That night, Ronnie, who played at Georgia in the 70s, said this. He said, quote, the sport of football carried me places and taught me things I never thought possible. It was the end of Ronnie's quote. Indeed, it is the leaders in college football, people like Coach Dooley, who have made that possible for all of us to be carried places and taught things we never thought possible. For those of you who played for Coach Dooley here at Georgia, 
thank you for being part of the Southeastern Conference. What we do today is because of what you did then with him. Barbara, thank you for sharing your husband with us, but with all of us in the SEC. Deanna, Denise, Daniel, and Derek, who I imagine is grinding on video right now near Tuscaloosa, Alabama, thank you for sharing your father with us. To the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the Dooleys, I hope you hear the impact of leadership through every one of these presentations this evening. Not only leadership, but the multiplication, multiplication of leadership through people impacted by that life well lived. And I hope you can draw on that service, that wisdom, and that leadership throughout your lives. Let us celebrate, but let us never forget the remarkable journey of Vince Dooley. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of the most valuable, gracious, and humble members of the University of Georgia's Athletic Association. She's worked here at Georgia for 40 years, uh, doing just an incredible job. And when you talk about behind the scenes champions who are as great in their field as so many of our national championship coaches like Coach Bowerly, Coach Smart, Coach Wallace, Coach Hack, Coach Diaz are in theirs. Her numerous duties, including eligibility and academics, I sure wouldn't have graduated without her. She has done so much. In an article about her some 25 years ago, Coach Dooley said that when it came to Glada Horvat, the term jack of all trades had to be replaced. She's a Glada of all trades. Glada Horvat. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here speaking on behalf of our athletic staff tonight. I first started working in the athletic department as a freshman student assistant in the sports information office in the fall of 1979. That was also Coach Dooley's first year as athletic director. Back in those days, the sports information staff only traveled with a few sports. So many of us spent a lot of evenings up in the SID office in the Coliseum right up there waiting on coaches to call from the road with their results so we could get it out to the media. Many of those nights we would see Coach Dooley up there in his not so very large corner office, working hard, toiling away. It couldn't have been easy for him to be the head football coach and the athletic director, and it is no wonder that he had to work the night shift to get everything done. After I graduated and became a full-time employee as the women's sports academic counselor, I had more opportunities to observe how he worked. Coach Dooley knew how to hire good people and then let them do their job. We lost one of the best last week in Dick Copas, who came in 1963 and he wore many hats during his long tenure. Another great man that Coach Dooley brought over from Auburn to handle the day-to-day -day operation of the athletic department was Lee Haley. Coach Haley may have controlled the purse strings, but everybody knew who was in charge, who had the final say, that was Coach Dooley. This year is also the 50th anniversary of Title IX, the breakthrough federal law requiring equal opportunity in educational programs, including athletics. In his early years as AD, it fell to Coach Dooley and Women's Athletic Director Liz Murphy to make a game plan to elevate women's sports with the goal of making our men's and women's teams equal. Equality didn't happen overnight, but they quickly built a very strong program that won the first SEC Women's All Sports Trophy and many more. It was not easy to change things that had always been done a certain way. But Liz and Coach Dooley worked together on those hard things because it was important to them to do the right thing. For example, we knew it wasn't fair for the men's tennis team to play their matches at the grandstand at Henry Field Stadium, while the women played their matches on the course beside McWhorter Hall with just a few rows of metal bleachers. But that's the way it had always been done. 
Georgia was hosting the men's NCAA tournament every year back then. But when some other schools finally built improved facilities, that began to change. That first year that we had the opportunity to host the women's NCAA tournament, our tennis team won the national championship right there at Henry Field Stadium. The record shows that Georgia won 23 national team championships in a variety of sports during Coach Dooley's tenure as athletic director. Seven of those were won by men's teams, and the remaining 16 were won by women's teams. I think they got that game plan working pretty good. But it was not always smooth sailing for Coach Dooley. He navigated the Jan Kemp trial and the accompanying campus backlash in the mid-80s. There were NCAA investigations into recruiting, and there was a basketball saga that drew national attention. But we always came out stronger on the other side because we had the calm and steady hand of Coach Dooley guiding our program. Kirby talks about being elite, but Coach Dooley was the one who made our entire program elite. He had us develop a mission statement before anyone else was doing it. And when you look at that statement now, you see those values, it really sums up how Coach Dooley approached his job of athletic director. What were those values in that first mission statement? Integrity, personal development, teamwork, excellence, and leadership. Coach Dooley was honest and forthright in all of his dealings, and he knew that the primary purpose was to promote the personal growth and well-being of our student athletes. We have all seen his slogan, Big Team, Little Me, that so aptly expressed his sentiment that the success of any one person is always the result of dedicated effort on the part of many people. He was constantly focused on excellence in competition, in academics, in fundraising, in facilities, in every aspect of our program. He wanted Georgia to be the best, no question about it. Coach Dooley was smart, he was well read, he was a student of history, and he was someone who appreciated the arts. But I would be remiss if I did not mention another trait that I observed, and that was his knack for being what I call harmlessly oblivious. When we were invited to the Poland Weed Eater Bowl in 1991, he didn't know what a weed eater was. This was long before he took up gardening, and we had to explain what a weed eater did. And I do not know if he ever actually learned how to rent a car. Anytime he would fly to a location where one of our teams was playing for a championship, somebody on the staff had to go pick up Coach Dooley at the airport. And then there was the unforgettable discussion in the senior staff meeting about whether Hooters was an appropriate sponsor for women's sports. <laughs> Liz Murphy was adamant in her opinion that it was not appropriate. But Coach Dooley didn't understand why she felt so strongly. She said, it's just not nice because of the other meaning of the word. And he still didn't get it. He said, what other meaning? She finally had to blurt it out, and then he just stammered around and said, oh, no, you're right. It's definitely not appropriate. But he was also a kind gentleman who was quick to offer his handkerchief when I got sick right in front of him on a small plane flying back from Birmingham. And I was recently told by one of our former staffers, who is now an AD, that Coach Dooley invited them over to his house and helped them prep for interviews and continued to be a great source of encouragement through the years. Coach Dooley has a long list of leadership roles and community service, but I'm sure there are many individual stories of things he did to help others that we will never know. So thank you, Coach Dooley for the positive influence you had on so many of us and for building this outstanding program that we love and celebrate today.
Our final speaker of the night is quite simply the greatest swim coach who ever lived and one of the greatest bulldogs of all time. Uh, he got the job back in 1979 and just retired. So let's see, 70s, 80s, 90s, years. So six different decades he was a part of it. Uh, seven national championships from 1999 through 2016. Georgia finished first or second nationally 15 times in 18 years. Hundreds of All-Americans and Olympians representing dozens of countries. Now, I got to work the Olympics in 2012 in London, and I got to cover swimming. And we had swimmers from the University of Georgia representing 11 different countries. And you cannot imagine that the pride this Georgia Bulldog felt. And I was doing some interviews, and one Florida swimmer came by, and he had a gator tattoo. And I said to my uh, camera operator, who was from Australia, there was nothing about college sports, yeah, that guy's a bleeping gator. And, uh, then a guy came up with a Texas tattoo, and I go, oh, that guy goes to Texas. He goes, is he a bleeping gator too? I go, we don't hate them. They're just the Longhorns. They're fine. The highlights of his international career was being the head coach of the 2008 United States Olympic team when Team USA won the most gold medals and the most medals of any country in the Olympic Games. A protege of Coach Dooley and Coach McGill, the great Jack Bowerly. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, everybody. It's both an honor and a privilege to be here tonight to honor the legacy of the best man I have ever known. Coach has been the rock of our athletic department since he arrived here. And he and Barbara were holed up in the Holiday Inn on an ice stormy night with a few kids in tow, very young ones, watching Auburn, if I remember, play in the Orange Bowl, and you thought, there was a big mistake done here. <laughs> coach started here in 63 as the youngest Division I football coach. And as Jeff sort of alluded to, I think, he was what we needed at the time. He was the leader we needed at Georgia at a really critical time in our athletic department. To work for Coach was an absolute dream come true. <clears throat> he. Uh, he sort of let us go, and he let us do our thing. Uh, just this afternoon, I was on a little text thread with uh, many coaches here, some of Georgia's winningest coaches, and one of whom, Andy Landers, simply said, Coach sensed when people were passionate about a challenge. One of his best traits, best traits was that he st stayed away from our lanes that we were involved in and let us make our own decisions, and he did not micromanage. He never questioned what we did as our decision making. He just coached so long he knew he didn't have to coach us, and he let us alone. Basically, he trusted us, and he never wanted us to let him down, and I never wanted to let him down. He had a direct hand in 43 out of 47 NCAA championships here, whether it was people that he hired that kept on play, or coaching, but 43 out of 47. There is one time, there was one time when he was somewhat intrusive in my career. <clears throat> we were at the NCC championships at the University of Florida. And uh, I hope there are not any of my diving alumni here tonight, but our divers were very weak that year, and we had a, a team limit that we could take. So I took all swimmers in taking, instead of taking any divers. So <clears throat> it was a strategic move that was actually a good move. But during that time, diving started early, and then we started with a couple relays. So at that time, without any divers, we were coming off two SEC titles and getting ready to win the national championship that year. And Coach looked at the results with Claude Felton, and I got a phone call from Coach, and I've never had one before a meet or during a meet. 
we were in dead last after a day and a half. So I get this, co I get this call from coach in the afternoon, said, uh, Jack, I said, yeah, coach. He said, everything all right down there? <laughs> I said, we'll be fine in about a day. <laughs> so we ended up winning the, national, or the uh, SEC championship, international championship that year. All of us like to share the best moments of our lives <clears throat> with our parents, but I always had one more call to make, and that was always the coach. Whether it was in Sydney, whether it was in Greece, Athens, Greece, whether it was in Beijing, London with you, Jeff, Rio, and lastly in Tokyo. And um, I'll never forget, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I will. Um, <laughs> When I was at the opening ceremonies at my first Olympic Games as a, as a coach, we had five, uh, five Olympians there from our uh, swim team. And I was getting, we were right there in the middle where Olivia Newton-John was, and she was coming right down close to us. And then a friend of mine told me he had a cell phone, and he said, Jack, if you got a minute, I can give you this cell phone. Back then, 2000, we didn't carry them all the time. And so I was sort of like, okay, Olivia Newton-John's coming down here, or I can call my mother and Coach Dooley. Well, I got a few years off of purgatory for that one, and uh, so I, I did what I was supposed to do. Co Coach's legacy of excellence gives us all something to strive for. Uh, very simply, we all wanted to be like him. His legacy at Georgia will never, never, ever fade. Coach was my boss, Coach was my friend, he was my second dad. And he gave me so, and he gave so many people, not just me, a life here at Georgia that we could have never imagined. Thanks to Barbara, thanks to your family, thanks for sharing so much of Coach with so many people. And uh, this is such a privilege to be here and it's such a privilege to be a dog, and go dogs, and hell with tech. <laughs>you so much for a wonderful evening to the Dooley family. It's the greatest honor <clears throat> of my life being up here. Thanks to the Red Coat Band. Nothing finer in the land. Uh, there are some
we got the two greatest artists ever, Jack Davis and Steve Penley, and the book, Coach Dooley's Playbook, that he did with Steve Penley. Uh, it is for sale in here, and all the money goes to the Red Coat Band. Uh, altruistic till the end. Uh, the day that Coach Dooley passed away, I thought about our Georgia heroes. He was joining uh, Coach McGill, Coach Russell, the Mighty Munts, and Jack Davis, Bill Hartman, Joel Eves, and now Dick Copas. Four players that have gone, Steve Greer, Bill Stanfield, and Jake Scott. The next day we beat Florida. It was a hell of a day. Uh, Kevin Butler, David Dukes, and I sent a picture to Mrs. Dooley. And she sent me a text that Munson and Coach Russell were waiting there with a cigar. And Coach Hartman had a scotch and Coach McGill had a cold beer waiting on him. What a hell of a time they must be having up in a glorious slice of bulldog heaven. They're all together now. And there's one message from out there for tomorrow. Beat Tech. Thank you so much to everyone. Go dogs. God bless you, Coach Dooley, and good night.